Yeah, we might uh, we might make a start. I'm sure uh, more people will join us over the next uh, over the next few minutes. Um, but we just uh, we've got a one hour webinar today, so we'll we'll start now so we can make the most of the time. But welcome everybody, and and thank you for joining us. My name is David Spriggs. I'm the, the CEO of Info Exchange and the chair of the Australian Digital Inclusion Alliance. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm joining from today. Um, for me, that's the beautiful and unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, um, and First Nations people that we have here with us today, um, and the beautiful sunshine outside, um, land that you can see always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so welcome everybody today to, and thank you for joining us for our ADIA meetup in conjunction with the First Nations Digital Inclusion Advisory Group. Um, today's session is going to be a little bit different. A lot of these meetups, uh, we have presenters speak and then we have some Q&A. Um, in this session, our, our presenters would love to get your feedback on the, uh, the First Nations Digital Inclusion Advisory Group as they're working on their, their roadmap. Um, so there will be Q&A, um, but we would really like feedback for the, for the presenters as well. Um, and it'll be a great opportunity to, uh, to help shape the, the roadmap that the, that the team are working on. Um, as always in, in these sessions, really encourage everybody to keep the conversation going in the chat um, as, we're, as we're talking through um, and put any questions into, into the Q&A box. Um, and I think it's a great combination of people that we've got joining us today. We've got people from grassroots community organisations. We've got people from larger not-for-profits. We've got people from government. We've got people from industry. Um, we've got people from universities joining us. So, so thank you, everybody, for, for taking the time. Um, a bit of housekeeping. Today's session is being recorded. Um, we'll start the, the session with, with each of our panellists giving an overview and a bit of context, and then we'll get into some dialogue and discussion. But as I say, kind of please keep the chat going through the entire session um, and make use of the, the Q&A box if there's specific questions you'd like to ask or specific feedback you'd like to give in the session. Um, and before we get started on today's topic, a little bit of background on the Australian Digital Inclusion Alliance. So the ADIA was established in 2017, um, following the, the National Year of, of Digital Inclusion. Um, it's a shared initiative. We have over 500 business, government, academic and community organisations participating in the Alliance. Um, and very much we're around an action orientation. So when we were forming the Alliance, there was an idea to create a digital inclusion roundtable. And uh, we thought there's enough of people sitting around tables discussing things. Um, we want this to be an alliance with a, with an action orientation. Um, and we acknowledge the, uh, the initial support of Australia Post in getting the alliance up and running. And today the alliance is supported by Info Exchange, Google, Telstra and TAS Networks and very much um, say thank you and appreciate the support of, of those organisations. And our vision is, is to create a digitally inclusive Australia where everybody is able to fully participate in the economy and, and society. Um, we work on kind of three pillars of digital inclusion, which we'll touch on today, I'm sure, in the discussion around affordability, accessibility and digital ability. Um, and sometimes people ask me, you know, why do we why do we still do this work? Why is this still needed? Um, I know I'm preaching to the converted largely today. Um, but it comes as a surprise to a lot of people that the uh, results of the Australian Digital Inclusion Index, which show that almost 10% of our population remains highly digitally excluded and an additional 14.2% that are digitally excluded. So, so bringing that together, almost a quarter of our population still remains digitally excluded. Um, and certainly coming on to today's topic, a, a large gap between First Nations and non-First Nations people in Australia and that gap in 2023 was, was 7.5, which came through strongly in the First Nations Digital Inclusion Advisory Group in their, in their initial paper. So today, as I say, I'm delighted to have, and, and thank you so much for your, for your time, the, uh, the First Nations Digital Inclusion Advisory Group. Um, we'll ask the panelists to speak in a moment, but uh, I'll, just, I'll try and give some, some short introductions to our panelists, which is, which is difficult um, because the three panelists that we have today 
um, are amazing, are amazing people. Um, so firstly, we have Dot West, OAM, who's the co-chair of the First Nations Digital Inclusion Advisory Group. Um, Dot is a Noongar woman from the southwest of Western Australia, has ties to the north and has been living and working in the Kimberley region since 1977. Um, Dot's a director of Broome-based Galari Media Enterprises, I mean, it's known for her riding on the heights and the circuit, but the, the call out I would love to give is my children's, one of their favourite programmes has been Little Jay and Big Cuz, and that is, uh, that is a programme that, uh, that Dot's done a lot of work on. So um, honoured honored to have you on all of the work that you've done, but that for me is a, is a particularly special one for, for my children. Um, Dot's also served on, on a number of boards and advisory groups, including SBS, NITV, Screen West, the National Indigenous Radio Service and as Chair of, of First Nations Media Australia. Um, so honoured to have you with us, Dot. Um, we also have Associate Professor Lyndon Ormond-Parker, who's also the co-chair of the First Nations Digital Inclusion Advisory Group. Um, Lyndon is Aboriginal man of the Oyawara descent um, from the Barclay Tablelands region of the Northern Territory. Um, he's an academic researcher focusing on Indigenous communities in the areas of information technology, digital inclusion and cultural heritage. He's the principal research fellow on the Mapping the Gap um, project, which is well known to, to most of us on, on this call, which is supported by the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making. He also has an ARC research fellowship with the Centre for Heritage and Museum Studies at the Australian National University. Um, and last but certainly not least, someone also very well known to uh, a number of people on this call is Professor Ellie Rennie. Ellie's a professor at RMIT University um, at an ARC funded Future Fellow researching permissionless technologies using ethnographic methods. And prior to this fellowship, her work has been focused on digital inclusion in remote Indigenous communities. Um, she somehow found, found time to write five books and produce two audio documentary series um, and is also a research director within the international research network, Medigov. Um, so as I say, we're, we're incredibly privileged to, to have the three of you with us today and, and thank you um, for being so generous with your time. Um, but I'm gonna pass first to, uh, to Dot and Lyndon, who are gonna give us a, an overview of the advisory group's work to date, um, probably talk to the, uh, the amazing initial report that was put out um, late last year, and then sort of looking to the future on the, the roadmap. So I'll pass over to, uh, to Dot and Lyndon, thank you. Oh, you're on, you're on mute, Dot. Thank you. Yes. Doesn't that sound like an ad? Anyway, um, just firstly, I just want to um, say to you that I come to you from Bulu on Noongar Budja in Perth, and I would like to acknowledge the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and also all First Nations custodians, traditional owners of the lands we all zoom in from. I pay my respects to elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who've joined us today and offer a very warm welcome to all. With me today is my fellow co-chair, Associate Professor Linda Norman Parker and Professor Ella, Ellie Rennie, who is a member of the Digital Inclusion Expert Panel. Firstly, I'd like to thank Caitlin for her work in setting up this panel and David and Ishtar for the opportunity to speak at today's meetup. The advisory group was established by the Australian Government in January 2023. All our members are First Nations Australians and we are supported by a digital inclusion expert panel, which is made up of experts from across the media, broadcasting and telecommunications sector. The advisory group's purpose is to provide advice to the Australian government on ways to achieve target 17 of the National Agreement on Closing the Gap, which aims for equal levels of digital inclusion by 2026. In the bigger picture, target 17 aims to achieve outcome 17 which basically seeks to ensure First Nations Australians have access to information and services, enabling participation in informed decision-making regarding their own lives. It is our view that digital inclusion is a human right. 
Even in 2011, the UN report noted that the internet vastly expands the capacity of individuals to enjoy their right to freedom of opinion and expression, which is an enabler of other human rights. The advisory group has always emphasised that digital inclusion is not about forcing people or services online, but ensuring that First Nations people have the choice to do so in an informed and safe way to take advantage of all the opportunities an increasingly digitised world provides. We have also emphasised that the one size fits all approach doesn't work. So therefore, place-based solutions in partnership with the individual communities must be paramount in whatever industry, government and the NGOs undertake to help close the digital divide. For those that aren't aware, in October 2023, the advisory group published its initial report with over 20 recommendations based on extensive engagement with First Nations organisations, government and industry. It's available online on our webpage for those who like to have a read. And uh, this includes the recommendation for a national device bank, which I was proud to be a panel member on at the last ADIA meetup and the launch of their paper on device donation and reuse. The recommendations in our initial report is the basis for our upcoming roadmap, which I will pass on to my fellow co-chair, Associate Professor Linda Norman-Parker to talk about. Go for it, Linda. Great, thanks, Dot. <clears throat> and I am just recovering from COVID, so I've got a bit of a uh, cold here today. Um, but look, uh, I'm coming to you from Nam here in Melbourne, and I pay my respects to all those traditional owners from everywhere that we're all dialing in from today. And also would like to acknowledge um, our other advisory group members online today, as well as our expert panel members uh, today. And uh, thank you all for joining. So the next phase of our work after our initial report uh, was launched last year will be a roadmap on how we can close the gap uh, on digital inclusion. And the roadmap will be informed by, through a series of public consultations, as well as public submissions. We're currently drafting the discussion paper and a basic format for the roadmap. But for those here today, I'm happy to inform you that you are essentially getting an opportunity to shape the roadmap and for you to let us know what should be included in such a roadmap. Our online submissions will be launched by the 1st of May and will be open until the 28th of June on the advisory group's website and a have your say on the Department of Infrastructure's website. However, <clears throat> even if you don't make the deadline for the advice, deadline for submissions, the advisory group will be traveling around Australia and we will continue to shape our roadmap uh, as it develops with a, hopefully a launch by the end of this year. You can also email us as well if you'd like to provide a late submission. Many of you here are experts on providing support and guidance to people in need, including First Nations and all Australians. You also have a deep understanding on what digital inclusion means and the opportunities it could provide for First Nations and digitally excluded people in general. The advisory group has always advocated for place-based solutions because there is no single answer on how to solve digital inclusion. And what digital inclusion means to First Nations people will vary from town to town and region and remote areas. Some people will think of digital inclusion as simply going online and access, accessing essential services. For others, it will be taking part in the latest technologies and driving innovation through a unique First Nations lens. While you're listening to this talk today, we would like to encourage you uh, to consider the following questions. How do we balance a place-based approach with the need to improve digital inclusion at the national level? How can we ensure government and industry design appropriate products and services to meet the needs of First Nations people? And how can government and industry empower communities to navigate the financial side of getting and staying connected? I'll just drop these questions into the chat for people to consider further when we open up to discussion later. I'll now pass back to David. Thanks, David, who will introduce Ali. Thanks. Thanks very much, um, Dot and Lyndon. Um, and yes, um, please, please have a think about the, the questions that Lyndon's just talked to and he's going to post them into the chat. 
um, we'd love to have some initial conversation on that as the if you're in the chat and then we can uh, we can open it up for for discussion um, after we hear from from Ellie. But uh, over to you, Ellie, and looking forward to hearing from Ellie on some discussion on some of the expert panels thought and some of the work that you think might uh, might be underpinning the roadmap. Thank you, Ellie. Thanks, David. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the Woiwurrung and Boomerang language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation. Um, I want to briefly just touch on some of the thoughts and work of the expert panel. So we support the advisory group uh, through research and analysis um, as they require it and have been trying to feed in to the roadmap work to date. The advisory group and expert panel have also provided a submission to the review of the Universal Service Ob Services Obligation, and I think that is uh, a good document for people who are trying to engage on where we're up to, to read. And I think we're starting from that with this next process. You can find that on our website. And during the process of pulling that together, we've also identified some areas that tend to get lost or require a shift in approach. So one major example of this is that consumer preferences are often lost. Um, so of course, technologies and how we use the internet will always change. And therefore our broader policy and, and funding um, approaches shouldn't be constrained by specific metrics or technologies. Uh, so we're suggesting, for instance, more of an outcomes-based focus um, in our USO submission, and um, that includes adjusting to uh, adjusting the way we think about universal service to thinking through what informs consumer preferences. Um, it's, I'm sure people here uh, know that digital inclusion is very much an umbrella term and underneath that there sits a lot of factors like norms and capabilities, your obligations to others, et cetera, and that these can manifest as particular group exclusions or inclusions. Um, the other side to this is that um, our current frameworks don't necessarily deal with redundancy or design for resilience. So things like overcoming slow speeds, high latency and outages, these might actually require a range of technologies and primary and secondary services, as Lyndon and Dot have mentioned. Uh, that 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 is what we mean when we say place-based approach. Um, so for the roadmap itself, we aim to have a technology agnostic approach focusing on the individual needs of First Nations communities rather than the individual technological solutions that are currently available. Um, of course, with things like Leosats um, arriving, that we would already see these massive changes um, before us, and that will change again. So also beyond the usual digital inclusion metrics of access, affordability and digital ability, which David said are these pillars of ADIA as well, uh, we feel that our roadmap that we're working on needs to emphasise appropriateness of devices, plans, websites, content and government services. So this is not measured at the moment, but could be a good metric or standard for government and industry. Um, we want to Think about awareness of connectivity options and other opportunities such as better ways to access content that's also not really measured. Um, and thinking through the communicative ecology in each place, so whether people have free-to-air television will impact on their data use, for example, or if they have access to public Wi-Fi, that will help them to defray the costs of data um, and not every community has the same um, broadcasting or Wi-Fi setups and that influences digital inclusion in places. Uh, we especially also need better data for regional and metro areas. Um, so we do know that things like household size can distort some measures for instance the way that income is aggregated but it's not actually telling us much about digital inclusion as a result. Um, so these are the kind of considerations that we're 
taking on board as we think about how we can design a roadmap, but also the measures that go with it and the outcomes, um, how we know when we've reached outcomes. So some of the things for the audience to think about and, and let us hear your responses to would be how can we strengthen the connectivity literacy of First Nations people and communities, including raising awareness of consumer protections, how can industry and government products and services made to be more inclusive for those who have a low level of English literacy? And what kinds of data would be most useful to you and your organisation or community? And I'd, another one I'd throw in there would be um, that digital inclusion is also important for um, meeting other closing the gap targets such as areas uh, of health, education, employment, and promoting First Nations culture. Um, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and specific examples, for instance, of how digital inclusion might support improved access to services that you provide and how our roadmap can help advocate for progress towards achieving other targets. So I'll hand back to you, David. Thank you. Oh, over to Dot, actually, I think. <laughs> yeah, um, just to, um, I suppose, um, to wrap up our discussion, just wanting to um, remind people and let people know about uh, the uh, First Nations Digital Inclusion Advisory Group's key principles for the roadmap. And those key principles are the importance of place-based approaches, um, and ensuring that there is partnership with the First Nations communities for both the design and implementation of any program so that their unique needs, aspirations and environment are considered. Also, another key principle is moving from a closing the gap, um, so a negative uh, uh, standpoint, to more of innovation and excellence. So fostering an empowered First Nations communication sector will be key to future-proofing First Nations communities by providing opportunities for enhancing technical skills, innovation and development within communities. This will ensure First Nations people and communities are well equipped to adapt and thrive as technologies and consumer preferences change over time. Also, it's important that there is First Nations representation in key organisations across the telecommunications sector, government agencies, and in key bodies overseeing consumer rights and protections. It's ensuring that um, if it's anything about us, we need to be included in the discussion in order to ensure that um, whatever we do is successful. Also um, adopting, as Ellie said, a technology agnostic approach to long-term recommendations and solutions and centering First Nations consumer preferences. So it's ensuring that First Nations people, their preferences are taken on board. So they're our key principles um, towards um, developing this roadmap. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dot. So we've got, we've got some questions there in the chat. Um, and I guess now at the point would really encourage everybody to please put any put any comments or feedback or questions in the in the chat or the or the QA box. We'd love to would love to have a sort of broader discussion on on each of those. And I think there's so much to unpack in in each and every one of those questions, um, as well as some of the principles that uh, that Dot's just been through. Um, so while, while you're putting some in, we've got a, a couple in there already. The the first one we're doing is, is a good high level question to ask. Um, it's from Parag from Optus um, to kind of just expand a bit on what we mean by digital inclusion and exclusion. Um, and I'm always the first that's often guilty of this, talking all about digital inclusion and assuming everybody knows what that means. Um, but whether we can hear a bit more from the panel on kind of how you see digital inclusion in a First Nations context. And the question there is, is it is it just around access to tools and internet and computers? Is it around digital ecosystem? Is it around how to navigate that? Um, 
and I and I would suggest you know is it about a much bigger piece of um, access, for example, to products and services by First Nations people? But kind of how how you how you define that the the work of the of the advisory group from a digital inclusion perspective. Lyndon, you want to take that? Sure. So um, when we talk about digital inclusion, there are three main themes that emerge. One is around access, which is uh, connectivity. So we know that um, uh, access is uh, really important for people. Uh, and we've found through the work of the advisory group that uh, as you go regional remote, uh, that access and connectivity uh, can be issues for people. The next part of digital inclusion is affordability. So people being able to afford to actually connect. Uh, what we've found through the Mapping the Digital Gap project is people in very remote and remote areas, Aboriginal communities, uh, something like 90, over 90% 90 of Aboriginal people are on pay-as-you-go uh, prepaid mobile uh, uh, plans. So, uh, and also that we do understand that prepaid, you're paying the highest per gigabyte uh, when you are connecting on a prepaid mobile plan. So, and then the third area is access, there's access, affordability and ability. So people's ability to actually get online and be informed about the products and services that are available to them in their area or region. So those three particular areas we're trying to uh, focus work is the focus uh, of developing the roadmap to work out solutions in all of those three areas. And as we've said before, we're looking at place-based solutions. So uh, it might mean uh, expanding connectivity and ensuring that um, uh, Aboriginal people in very remote areas where they don't have access to uh, a telephone service that they they might be able to uh, have access to the internet and um, uh, um, have, have a service provided to them so that they can actually do Wi-Fi calling and other solutions like that. So we've been had the privilege of uh, working and with Telstra and the NBN who are on our expert panel to find solutions around the connectivity aspect of, of uh, connectivity. Um, and we've also had through the uh, regional connectivity program uh, in the last round, we've had something over 35% of the successful uh, grants given in those were targeted for First Nations people. And we've also had uh, recently, the minister announced that 20 uh, Aboriginal communities uh, will be receiving a free Wi-Fi service. So uh, NBN have been uh, working on selecting those particular communities. Uh, and again, from the advisory group's perspective, it's really about um, areas of greatest need for those particular services. So when we talk about digital inclusion, it's generally around access, affordability and ability. And um, Ali might want to add something. She's been working in this space much longer than I have and has been heavily involved in the Australian Digital Inclusion Index. So, yeah, Ali. Look, this is a tricky question, I think, with respect to the work that we're doing. I think the coming at it as a researcher, we have some great data that we can use as a baseline or as a comparison with Australia as a whole around those measures that Lyndon's mentioned, access, affordability and ability uh, coming out of the ADII and uh, other research that's been done. But it, digital inclusion is so nuanced and, and it is different in every place and it's different depending upon um, your what how your community say shares devices or um the the mobility of that community they're always in the one place or are they you know they're moving around uh, and we know in remote areas and i was looking at this 15 years ago and there's much more recent research than mine on it that these things do affect people what decisions people make when they purchase devices and products and plans and so and 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 then also how say the telecommunications companies or NBN are uh, providing those services and products comes into play when we're talking about digital inclusion. And I, so it's not just about saying it's access, it's also what's available to people and how does that affect their opportunities and the choices that they make. That, that's the kind of more um, holistic approach we're trying to take when we're, so when we're talking about things like um, 
the you know the, the people's preferences that's what we mean but also um we don't at the same time want to impose a higher bar <laughs> because we, we, you know it's about closing the gap so we have these measures how do we work with them without then uh ignoring the the, the big contextual factors that may be very different for at least some first nations communities Fantastic. Thank you. That's a great. That's a great explanation. Thank you. And and kind of the people's preferences, um, goes back to what Dot was saying before about the importance of choice as well. So it's not necessarily an assumption that everybody has to be digitally included to a to a certain level. It's that it's that choice. Um, I mean, building building on that, one of the other questions here, question slash feedback, I would guess is is kind of asking is co-design a key principle of the roadmap development and a bit of what was just being talked about earlier of nothing about us without us but if you if you could talk to yeah how, how you might see that in the context of the roadmap because also if you're looking at place-based initiatives um that's potentially a very large scale of of co-design and engagement to, to truly represent the needs of communities um so we'd, yeah we'd love to hear on that that principle of co-design lyndon i wonder whether um you could draw on um the mapping um the, the gap uh, reports that you've been undertaking and examples in terms of co-design in specific communities? Yeah, well, um, one of the things that we do when we are undertaking our research, for instance, in the Mapping the Digital Gap project, uh, which is um, funded and supported uh, through Telstra and, um, and, the, and the work of Lauren Ganley's team, um, we've taken an approach where we partner with local Aboriginal community organisations uh, and we take an, an Indigenous uh, data governance framework. So we work in partnership with those on the ground. Uh, we employ uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander researchers, uh, which work with us in, for instance, if it's a remote area where uh, English is not the first language spoken. So whatever is a good example in the Tamaru region of the Northern Territory where we work, we employ local um uh, language speakers. Uh, Murrumbatta is the dominant language in that particular township. So we employ uh, Murrumbatta speakers to help with the survey and uh, when we're doing interviews with people. Uh, we also pay our community researchers, of course, uh, the standard university rate. Uh, we also um, have them on as authors of our reports uh, and we pay the community-based uh, organisation uh, a, a, a fee for working with us as well. So we also provide uh, the reports back to the community and our reports are publicly available. Uh, and part of that is uh, designing a digital inclusion strategy for each individual community, uh, working with them around some of the aspects um, where they can see work towards an improvement on those three areas, connectivity, affordability and ability. Uh, and so um, it's really doing that partnership. So it's really co-designing with the community, uh, their digital inclusion plans, uh, but also uh, engaging at that um, very base level with our research uh, with the communities concerned. Um, but we also, this is definitely going to be, and there was a question in, in the chat around co-designing. So uh, our advisory group is an all Indigenous advisory group to Minister Rowland. Uh, and we also have Indigenous people on our expert panel, such as um, the lovely Lauren Ganley, who's online, as well as other ind in Indigenous people there. Uh, Shay Cockatoo Collins from NBN as well. So um, working with uh, also working with our great team in the department and Andy and his his teammates and Jason there as well. Uh, and we are encouraging the department to also employ Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this space as well. So um, it's a big team effort. Dot, do you want to say anything else? <laughs> yeah, so I suppose in terms of talking to the co-design um, co question, it is very much... Um, um, when we talk about place-based solutions. It's about, it's about industry, it's about NGOs, working in partnership with the community along with government to ensure that um, whatever solutions uh, that, that 
are arrived at, they are co-designed so that first and foremost, the community's needs and preferences are taken account of in the first instance. Fantastic, thank you. And and to build on to build on that, I don't know if you want to talk any further, but to how you think about that community-based strategies. I think and a lot of the discussion often goes to kind of remote and very remote communities, but kind of how you see how you see that working in more of the, you know, the metropolitan or the larger the larger regional centres. Um, whether there's any more you want to say about that, and then would would love to have some feedback um from the from the group online as well. Look, I, I suppose in terms of in terms of the uh the um urban and regional centres, there are uh, connectivity choices that are available. And I think um, there is one question there in the chat about um, connectivity literacy. And that is certainly on our um, on our minds as well, especially for the, uh, the communities, the places that do have choices, um, choices of how they connect so that they are fully aware of making sure they're fully aware of what is available, what deals are out there and what will best suit them as an individual, as a family and possibly as, you know, a town community. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and there's another question in the chat from, I think it's from Michelle Emmett. Um, it's asking about how critical is the need for the Commonwealth to legislate minimum standards for telecommunications Potentially that, I guess that could be broadened, but kind of the, the thinking and the feedback that goes into developing the roadmap in terms of what elements you think, if any, might need to be enabled through legislation um, versus working through other means. Ellie, you want to take that one on? Uh, well, it could mean many things. Um, you know, pay phones in remote communities we know are very important and, that you know, that that is some access to telephony, but it's not necessarily um, the kind of telephony where you've always, you're always in contact or um, where it's in your home. So minimum standards, I think we, uh, we would like more input on this one and what that might mean, um, even whether the importance of pay phones generally, uh, not just in remote areas. We are also interested in say how leo stats might change that for instance you know should if we have a device bank should it um be compatible with this direct to device technology that enables people to at least receive texts wherever they are in in the country um so when we yeah and what do we even mean by telephony these days um because a, a text might be incredibly important if you're um in a place without connectivity and you're stranded and you need to get somewhere. Um, but we we also don't want that to take attention away from having broader internet connectivity, that that just becomes the default, which has been some of the problems we see when we when we get fixated on a particular um, te technology that suddenly that's insufficient and, you know, copper wires never reach this place, but that's all we're really interested in, et cetera. So, how do we, um, yeah, how do we reframe how we think about those standards as something we would love your input into? Fantastic. Thanks, Ellie. Linda, did you want to add to, did you want to add to that one as well? No, I think that's pretty much uh, but, um, no. but also uh, one thing that we haven't really discussed that much is people's ability. So one of the things that, um, we've found from both the ADII and others that uh, your level of education is an indicator of um, your your uh, ability to use technology and make informed decisions about about the your whether it's your mobile plans or being able to get online and use government services. So one of the things that um, <clears throat> we've found from uh, the ADII, uh, we now have a First Nations dashboard for the first time uh, ever, uh, utilising the surveys that were conducted through the Mapping the Digital Gap project 
to increase the responses for First Nations people. Again, we don't have enough uh, data at the national level uh, to cover First Nations people, uh, but that was one of the recommendations in our report. If we are going to try and close the uh, digital divide between First Nations and other communities, we really need to start out with some uh, really good baseline data. And the uh, Mapping the Digital Gap surveys have gone towards adding to the last Australian Digital Inclusion Index uh, but we also need to do more specific targeting. Um, and I know that the states and territories have uh, jumped on board with Target 17 of the Closing the Gap, and some are already starting to look at how they can do better data collection around First Nations uh, and digital inclusion as well. But that was one of our recommendations was for, um, for um, better baseline data for actually being able to track the gap over a period of time and given that the target is to reduce uh to for first nations to have uh, that gap closed by 2026 i think it's a very ambitious target but we'd like to start with some uh, decent baseline uh, research and to expand the adii i guess nationally uh specifically for first nations ali i don't know if you want to add anything there as well just gonna, I might just add, add add to that a little on the the data and measurement side. Um, it's come out in a in a number of forums, but so we obviously the importance of that data and measurement to look at the outcome and and the target. Um, but how how you're finding um the discussions on indigenous data sovereignty within the communities that you're consulting with and um and thoughts that you might have have on that from a from a digital inclusion perspective and the importance of data versus the respecting that local sovereignty of data. Yeah, um, well, all of the survey results um, uh, are made public uh, and also uh, and are fed back to the individual uh, communities concerned, uh, as well as the comments that come back uh, at the end of the surveys. Uh, and we, we um, provide all of that information back to the communities that work with us uh, and the community-based organisations that are partners. I have dropped a, um, a link in the chat where you can go and have a look at all of those mapping the digital gap reports and you'll see, you could pick out one randomly and then you look at the at the back of the report, you'll see uh, what we call a digital inclusion um, sort of a template for uh, improving digital inclusion um, at the back of each report. Um, and that's based on the research and the feedback from the communities concerned. Um, <clears throat> yeah. But also, but also to add to that is that it 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 is vital in order to empower First Nations people and communities, and for our self determination, that we are able to have access to data to data about ourselves, so that we are operating from an informed position when we're making our decisions about our lives. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And and I think that's answered, I think Lyndon, your your answer just answered one of the questions in the chat was, is there some examples of those digital inclusion strategies at a at a community level? Um another another question there, maybe maybe this is more a piece of feedback and a comment, but um if there's any response to this, it would be good if there was a preference to engage Aboriginal companies and organisations to co-design place-based strategies with individual communities. I think you talked already about the importance of you know working directly with First Nations communities, but is is that one of the principles that you would look at in the in the roadmap and the recommendations? I think most definitely I can respond to that, Doc. Um, most definitely. Um, and also, as we, we keep saying, it's all, all about place-based solutions. So every community is slightly different. One of the things that we had um, come across from both the Mapping the Digital Gap, the ADII, uh, and other pro projects and programs was um, a need in particular in some communities for uh, digital mentors. So often... Um, in, in a regional or remote community, you'll have uh, potentially, it could be the Centrelink office or it could be the local library or museum where they support uh, people getting online, accessing government services, whether it's Medi Medicare or uh, Centrelink services or the MyGov or taxation services online. Um, there's often someone in the community that will assist and support people doing that. 
Uh, one of the recommendations in most of our reports is around digital mentor touring in communities. Uh, Telstra, um, and it's something that um, I know Lauren is very passionate about, is having a digital mentors program uh, and uh, was one of our recommendations in our initial report. So, and we see that as a hub and spoke model where you can, you know, have a hub uh, where people can support digital mentors and that those digital mentors are actually uh, paid positions, whether it's, you know, for one day a week uh, that will actually support people uh, getting online and uh, being connected, uh, given that there are a lot of government services now uh, moving solely online, uh, all very few banks in regional and remote Australia, a lot have closed down over the years. So people being able to get online, but also online safely as well. So um, we're quite pleased and proud of the work that the East Safety Commissioner has done in the First Nations space as well. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, and I think there's now a bit of a role of educating people uh, in particular when there are things online that people want taken down. There is processes through the eSafety Commissioner's website that people can go on. So I think one of the issues I've found in talking to people, uh, there is also a big concern about kids getting online and um, uh, and also scams and other things as well that goes on, goes on in remote communities. And in particular, scams just through texting. So often I'll be out in the middle of, a remote community and get these scam texts they seem to be prevalent um wherever you go and uh making sure that people uh can understand um and scams and how to avoid them as well so yeah so the work and that... also also just to add on from uh Lyndon is that um whilst we're whilst we're wanting to have um have members of local communities skilled up within the um um within technology, either as mentees or mentors, uh, there is the bigger picture of um, engaging with our First Nations businesses in this space. And that we find that, um, that it is vital that not only do industry, government, engage with the local communities, but they also partner with our First Nations um, techs First Nations businesses in this space, and then you're taking a more holistic approach to um, solving the digital divide and providing services, but also you're enabling and you're supporting our First Nations businesses in the process. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Dot. And and the discussion on e-safety is probably a good segue to this question here from Julie Gibson, um, who's worked in communities for many, many years. Um, and maybe you've, you've partly answered this, Lyndon, talking about funding the digital mentors, but, but Julie's question is with co-designing the local community-based digital inclusion strategies and plans, is funding then provided to the communities to then implement these? Um, do you follow up on progress on the plans from a measurement perspective and, and any comments you might have on that as to whether that would be part of the roadmap or, um, or work that you're doing today? Um, yeah, so we... The um, reports that we give back to the communities, they often use them as an advocacy tool uh, and our reports um, are, um, go to Telstra uh, as well. So where there's issues around um, access and connectivity, uh, Telstra, we hope that, well, I actually know that Telstra has worked towards resolving some of the issues in some of the communities in which we've worked, uh, as well as the MBN and others so um so yes they are active um reports and it's a longitudinal over three years so we've gone back to each community and we have seen improvements uh, along the way we've also seen quite a um uptake of uh, leosat subscriptions with starlink um has has been moved has been moving along quite a bit in in, in remote areas uh, and I, we also see that um, there are other solutions in terms of digital mentors, uh, et cetera, that uh, the communities are moving towards uh, in instigating some of the recommendations in the report themselves. 
Um, so yeah, that's hope that's answered your question, Julie. It's possibly worth pointing out that uh, the advisory group makes recommendations to government rather than having a bucket of funding that it administers and um, you know has control over. Mm. So the the extent to which um, there would be programs or funding available at that localized level is probably not something we can address directly but we can uh, re make recommendations yeah. <laughs> well, the, gr the group can i can't yeah and we've made but, recommendations around connectivity and it was good to see uh government um uh the results of the regional connectivity program you know really targeted towards indigenous uh communities with 35 percent of the funding going to them uh in the last round so uh, I think we've recommended that um, that that sort of trend continues as well. Sorry, Doc. And also um, taking into consideration our initial report to the uh, federal government um, had uh, a number of recommendations of which the government are looking at. So we're anxiously awaiting the results of the next budget. Thanks, Doc. Thanks, thanks all. Um, just a reminder, we're getting close to time. So if there's any final questions, please please put them into the chat. And particularly if you think, you know, these aren't the right questions to be asking, we'd would love to hear that from people as well and, and any and any broader and any broader feedback that you have. Um, but there's a, a critical one here from Jess Wilson from Good Things Foundation and you can't do a, a meeting in 2024 without uh, artificial intelligence, AI, those two letters popping up. Um, and it's a great question around the potential that AI might have to support digital inclusion for, for First Nations communities. Um, but just whether that's being thought about in the roadmap, um, whether that's coming up in community consultation, whether that's all in the, the bubble land of, uh, of people who work in and out in, in digital tech, would, would love to hear your thoughts on, on the intersection of artificial intelligence and, and the work of the advisory group. Ellie, you wanna go first? I can take a stab at that very hard one. Um, so there's a few different things that come to mind on this. Um, obviously, AI and other technologies such as blockchain are going to transform the world, and we're seeing that commencing already. So digital inclusion matters because if you are excluded from uh, being able to access uh, those new capabilities, you're going to fall further behind, which is a point that those um, my my co-researchers on the Digital Inclusion Index have been making for some time. I think that in in terms of this particular group and the work they've been doing, this focus on excellence is really important and one that we need to keep sight of. Because for me, when we think about AI, it's not just about what how people are accessing chat GPT um, because, and, and that actually raises a whole lot of data sovereignty questions and issues um, for indigenous people. But what, what, govern, what is the governance of AI that is appropriate um, for communities? How do they create technologies that enable them to interact with their knowledges uh, and their, you know, their economies in ways that they control and um, I see huge potential through both those technologies for, um, so for instance, there's a, some work that I was involved in at RMIT on with, with, with Vic, Vic, Ag Vic and uh, Native Foods, so Indigenous groups here, um, Aboriginal groups, and, and so that these kind of notions of how they might control um, the stories that are related to those foods and the economies and the skills and the capabilities that come from having access to that data and then applying technologies like AI and blockchain to that, say data DAOs or whatever it might be, are super interesting ideas that are, that are, that are here. Um, but we, we need, um, the, we, it needs Indigenous people to lead it. Uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to really come up with those ideas and guide it. And that requires not just digital inclusion, but digital excellence, advanced training. And um, just, just to add on from that, you know, from a creative industries point of view, AI is both an enabler 
but also is a really nasty beast in the system. Um, so, so you know, it, it's sort of like the devil you do, the devil you don't type stuff and how much of what you do is protected. And I know that there's a number of court cases around the world um, where um, AI is being challenged. One of my major concerns uh, with AI is our Indigenous cultural intellectual property rights and ensuring that they are protected within the system. And <clears throat> That knowledge, that knowledge that we have across the nation, isn't um, isn't um, exploited um, for free, and isn't exploited in a way where there's information that is out there in the digital world that shouldn't be out there. So there's a fair bit of protection that needs to happen with AI. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that, the European Union has instigated some um, uh, legislation around AI and the use of AI, and I think um, that's something that's probably needed in Australia, and I think we could follow the EU's um, lead on that. Uh, and in particular, um, as Dot alluded to, in the music industry and others with AI, I think there's a, there's a lot of... Um, uh, risks with it uh, and a lot of infringements on intellectual property. Uh, there's also, for those interested in Indigenous intellectual property issues, there's also a consultation going on with the Department of Arts at the moment around some standalone Indigenous um, Indigenous intellectual and cultural property um, rights, standalone legislation, and I'll also drop that in the chat as well. But there's a good... Um, Ernst and Young summary of the EU legislation, which I'll drop in the chat as well. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And we're, we're just about at time, so we will we will wrap up in a minute. But I think that was a good point to end on on both the potential of artificial intelligence as well as some of those real challenges, as Dot and Lyndon have both said on the the creative industry side. We've we've heard that from a number of First Nations organisations and real concerns, not just on the you know, potential compensation, but whether it's appropriate at all for some of that material to be used in right across, whether it be you know, written forms, might be musical forms, or, or certainly the, the imagery forms as well. Um, and we'll make sure in the in the notes um, following the webinar that we distribute that information as well from um, that consultation from the Department of Arts. Um, so, to, so to wrap up, I mean, again, a, an enormous, huge thank you to to Dot and Lyndon and Ellie for for sharing their time with us. Um, we will circulate in the notes after the webinar um, how to engage in the the consultation for for the roadmap. Um, we really appreciate you giving us that early heads up on on some of the thinking and how that on how that consultation is going to work. Um, so, thank you again, everybody, for for joining us. Um, if you don't regularly join um, these meetups, then look out for a, a link from Caitlin where you can sign up to our ADIA newsletter and be involved in, in, future, in future events. Um, but again, a, a huge thank you from me to everybody for joining um, and to our speakers today. And, uh, and I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining us.